by welcoming you all to the San Francisco Dharma Collective. Uh, I'm MC Owens. This is the Dharma Doors. And tonight's going to be part four of three, four. Four, right? Yeah, this is the fourth mural. So part four of the sutra concerning the magician named Bhadra. Um, the Bhadra Maya Kara uh, Sutra is what we're calling it. It has a much longer, more complicated Sanskrit name, but we're just going to go with the Bhadra Sutra for now, especially part four. Um, it being part four, we're pretty far along in the story. Just to catch you up real quick, though, we're in Rajgriha, the um, uh, one of the major places where the Buddha taught. Uh, the Buddha is up on the vulture's peak. And there's this magician named Bhadra who gets this idea in his head, which he basically says, you know, everybody loves the Buddha. If I could somehow trick the Buddha, then everybody would think I'm better than the Buddha and everybody would like me. And so he concocts this uh, scheme to trick the Buddha into coming to the lowest, most filthiest place in Rajgriha uh, for a Dharma feast. And so by magic, the magician Bhadra creates this kind of pavilion, uh, a site of enlightenment is what it is called in the text. And upon seeing this miraculous offering to the Buddha of this kind of uh, bejeweled pavilion, the four great heavenly uh, guardians come and they say, what are you doing? And Bhadra says, well, I have invited the Buddha, the Tathagata, over for a Dharma feast. And they say, great, we want to do that too. And so the four great heavenly guardians create an even better, bigger, more bejeweled pavilion for a Dharma feast. And then the god Chakra Devanam Indra comes down and says, I want to make a offering of a pavilion to the Buddha as well. And so creates a third pavilion in order for this Dharma feast to happen. Bhadra doesn't know what to make of all of this. And so he tries to take back his magical creation, but he can't actually undo it. And that's when he begins to realize that he's really up against uh, a, a, a better magician, a true magician in that way. And so for the most part, what starts to happen is, is that at the end of where we left off last time, basically the magician Bhadra has seen the light. Actually, quite literally, he has seen the light because he has actually gazed upon the glorious body of the Buddha shining in radiance. And so he literally has seen the light. But I actually want to start with that idea. This sutra that we're reading is, uh, as I've said in the, the uh, part one, two, and three, this is part of a, a genre of Buddhist stories, which could be called the magic competition. And the gist of the magic competition is, is that somebody challenges the Buddha to a magic off, to a magical competition, basically in order to best the Buddha and gain his reputation. So this is a story. There's a bunch of different versions of this story. I'm actually going to share what might be the origin of this story. I'm going to share it with you tonight. But more than that, I want to start with this idea that this, this sutra, in addition to being part of the magic competition narratives, this story is also, um, for all intents and purposes, what might be called a conversion story. It is about someone like Bhadra, who's deceitful, who's a, a trickster. And it's about Bhadra coming to see the light in that sense. and. I just wanted to start with that tonight because what this sutra, why this sutra is really great, is it's a very interesting portrayal or a very interesting um, representation 
of the Mahayana Buddhist path to enlightenment. Um, all the, actually, all the way from being actually a non-believer, a non-Buddhist. Actually, he's a he's considered a member of a, the heterodox teachings. So he's even like, you know, way outside of the Sangha, or way outside of the Buddhist order. And so this story is about first, what we've seen is him coming over to Buddhism in that way. And then uh, we've got a little ways to go with this sutra, by the way. This is definitely not going to be the end of the story tonight. And so the as this story progresses, it's actually going to be about Bhadra um, kind of achieving these three distinct levels of enlightenment. And I'm going to try to talk about those a little bit tonight. We're going to get to the first level of this. Uh, and then I might talk about the other two levels, but it's certainly what the rest of the sutra is about. So we'll get there. So at this point, you know, my last mural, Bhadra was, you know, had kind of surrendered to the Buddha in that way. The Buddha has won the magical competition. And what we're going to do tonight is, tonight is basically, I'm just going to read, I guess there's sort of three movements to tonight. There's one, which is going to be about these three characters here. That's going to be the first part. It's kind of a very interesting moment in the sutra. We're going to spend some time on that. Then Bhadra is going to recite a very long poem, essentially in praise of the Buddha, with some questions built into it. And then if we have time, which I hope we do, we will hear actually from the Buddha. And the Buddha will respond in verse to Bhadra's questions that were given in verse. Um, and that's where I'm kind of hoping to take tonight. Um, but let's start, let's dive in. And I actually, I have something to say right away. So, um, oh, by the way, um, if it's your first night or if you didn't catch it the other nights, there's two English translations of this sutra. One is in the Treasury of Mahayana Sutras, the collection of the Maharatnakuta. And then the other one is the one I found online at Lapis Lazuli Text. Uh, dot com, and this is a, uh, a much better translation, the one uh, from Lapis Lazuli online. Um, however, tonight I'm probably going to jump back and forth. And I just want you to know that in general, the Lapis Lazuli version, I don't know the translator's name, I'm sorry. Um, this is a much better translation. It's far more accurate to the Chinese, which is also, you know, I'm reading, uh, this is a Chinese translation of the original sutra from Sanskrit. So this is a translation done by Bodhi Ruchi, a Buddhist monk from Central Asia, I believe. And he translated it from Sanskrit into Chinese. And then these are both translations from the Chinese. We don't have a Sanskrit version of this anymore. So we're relying on Bodhiruchi's Chinese and these English translations. This is a far more accurate translation of the Chinese. Um, and it's accurate in its choices of words. It's accurate in, in that it doesn't leave things out. It's accurate in that it doesn't add things that aren't there. It's also very accurate um, for the tense, meaning that it, it's a very, very uh, direct translation, which is good. But because we're doing some poetry tonight, we're reading, we're going to read Bhadra's poem and probably the Buddha's poem. I might actually wind up reading from the book because I actually think these translators did a better job of capturing the poetry of these things. But as usual, I'm going to break this down, not quite word for word, but the key words we're going to dive into. And then you'll see me going back and forth. So I just wanted you to know that. And so at that point, uh, this is after, of course, 
all of the monks and the bodhisattvas have recited their dharma verses. Um, then this is what happens. At that time, at that time, the world honored one in order to bring Bhadra the magician to maturity, the Buddha magically produced an elder approaching the assembly. The elder man asked Bhadra, what are you doing here? And, or why did you come here? According to the other translation, and the magician replied, I wish to make offerings of food and drinks to the Shramana Gotama, to the renunciant, to the recluse Gotama, to the Buddha. The elder spoke to Bhadra saying, do not speak in that way. The Tathagata is now with the bhikshus at the palace of King Ajatashatru receiving offerings of food. And by the spiritual power of the Buddha, the Buddha caused the magician, Bhadra, to perceive the Tathagata and all the bhikshus at King Ajatha Shatru's and perceiving their, perceived them there eating. Thereupon, by the miraculous power of the Buddha, the magician was able to see the Tathagata and the monks feasting there at King Ajatha Shatru's. So before we get into the second elder and the third elder that appear, I wanna take a moment just to address this very interesting word that began this. So what started this was at that time, because the world honored one, the Bhagavan, wished to bring the magician Bhadra to maturity. He produces these, he transforms his body into an elder, to an old man. That word, or that phrase, actually, I should say, bring him to maturity. That is a very, and I'm actually really stoked that they both translated it that way. They both translated as bring Bajra to maturity. The reason why I'm excited about that translation is because this idea of bringing someone to maturity is what bodhisattvas and Buddhas, but it's what bodhisattvas are in the business of doing. And what I mean to say is, is that you might be familiar with the idea that bodhisattvas make a vow to save all sentient beings. And actually, bodhisattvas do not make a vow to save all sentient beings. And no, I'm not being pranya paradoxical. Bodhisattvas don't make a vow to save all sentient beings. They make a vow to mature all sentient beings. And I think that's a very important distinction to make because when people that are new to Buddhism or people are new to the Dharma, and they hear this idea of bodhisattvas vowing to save all sentient beings, it sounds a little strange, maybe a little messianic, or maybe a little like, I don't know. And I too, actually, when I first started studying Buddhism, I kind of struggled with this idea, and I tried to like rationalize it, until of course I started studying Chinese, started reading the original texts, and I was like, Oh, they're not saving sentient beings. They're maturing sentient beings. And in fact, they're maturing all beings in that way. And I think that's actually really important to recognize. There's such a huge difference between those two ideas. The idea of maturing a sentient being, well, it would certainly depend on the sentient being, what that would look like. But for the most part, we're talking about educating, maturing, taking all sentient beings out of their childish phase and maturing them to a kind of adult phase in that way. So what I mean to say is, is that what's so special 
and beautiful and important about the idea of maturation is, is that, and you kind of get this when you read uh, a lot more about the Bodhisattva path, but when we're talking about maturing someone, there's a sense of, of this, you know, this something inside the person that just needs to be matured. It's them, they're, they're gonna do the work in a way, but the Bodhisattva helps in that maturation. The language of saving puts the Bodhisattva kind of up here and the person being saved down here. And you couldn't have done it without me or without the Bodhisattva because the Bodhisattva saved you. And that's sort of not at all <laughs> the relationship that's kind of being spoken about in, the, in Mahayana Buddhism and in the Bodhisattva path. And so this is a great uh, example of a Buddha in this case, not even a Bodhisattva, but a Buddha maturing ascension to being. In this instance, it's going to be the Buddha maturing Bhadra. So the first, so in order to mature Bhadra, the magician, the Buddha transforms his body, a miraculous transformation, and appears like an elder and says to Bhadra, what are you doing here? And Bhadra says, well, we're getting ready for big Dharma feast. I'm making offerings to the Buddha, to Gautama. And the elder, who's of course, really the Buddha disguised in it as an elder, says, no, you're not. The Buddha's over at King Ajatta Shakti's house having lunch. See? And by the miraculous power of the Buddha, Bhadra could see all the way to Ajatta Shatru's palace and could see the Buddha and the bhikshus there eating. Wow. <laughs> then, then the world honored one magically produced a second elder who also asked the magician, what are you doing here? The magician Bhadra answered, I'm making offerings to the Shramana Gautama. The second elder said, do not say that. Right now, the Tathagata and the Bhikshus are begging for food in the streets, um, in the streets of Rajgriha. By the miraculous power of the Buddha, the magician Bhadra was able to see the Tathagata and his venerable Bhikshus making their rounds in the streets begging for food. Then the world honored one produced magically a third elder who told the magician, right now the Tathagata is teaching the Sad Dharma, the wondrous Dharma to the four kinds of devotees in the garden of Jiva. The four kinds of devotees being monks and nuns, laymen and laywomen. Uh, and there the Buddha is teaching the wonderful law to the four kinds of believers or the four kinds of devotees in the garden of Jiva, the most prominent physician. Thereupon, by the miraculous power of the Buddha, the magician was able to see the Tathagata there. Then the world honor one created by magic, a Chakra Devanam Indra God, who came to the magician and said, Right now, the Tathagata is teaching the Dharma to my assembly in the heaven of the 33, uh, to, in the heaven of the 33. It's actually to, in the 33 levels of heaven. The magician again saw the Tathagata, this time teaching the essence of the Dharma to a host of gods in the 33 heavens. He also beheld the Tathagata endowed with the 32 auspicious marks and the 80 minor marks, simultaneously present among the trees, the flowers, and the foliage, sitting upon countless lion thrones amid the walled streets in the city of Rajgriha and in the houses, in the halls, and other superior places. And Bhadra also saw himself in all of those places where the Tathagata was. And he saw himself there repenting and confessing his wrongdoings. Then 
the magician saw nothing except the Buddha everywhere. Okay, I'm gonna pause there. So I'm gonna mention it now because it's gonna kind of become relevant. This um, miraculous transformation of the Tathagata or of the Buddha, this is a word, it's called a Vikarvanya. Vikarvanya is one of the siddhis or one of the magical powers or supernatural powers of a Buddha. And it's the ability to transform appearance in that way. And so Buddha's, the Buddha is known for this miraculous transformation ability of Vikarvanya. And so he, Vikarvanyas, these three elders, and then he Vikarvanyas up a chakra, and then, you know, eventually th this beautiful moment where then Bajra sees nothing but the Buddha everywhere, right? So that's where we're going with this uh, tonight. And I guess I just wanted to sort of pause on that, that image. And it's one of those things where, you know, I could just kind of read, I could just kind of continue reading and hope that this becomes clear to you, but I'm gonna say it more explicitly so that we can uh, enjoy the reading a little bit more. So, you know, it's important to keep in mind, of course, that this is a story. This is not a historical record of a time of the Buddha in that way. It's a story. And so what I mean by that is, is that the Buddha is already kind of a mysterious figure in this text because it's not referring necessarily to the historical Siddhartha or what have you. So the Buddha or the Tathagata is already rather kind of mysterious. And then it gets even more mysterious when the Buddha starts appearing in multiple bodies, starts appearing everywhere. Interesting to note how Bhadra also saw himself in all of those different places sitting with the Buddha, right? And then this all culminates in this beautiful final moment of, and then Bhadra saw nothing but the Buddha everywhere. And you know, that message of seeing nothing but the Buddha everywhere, that's very much the message of this sutra. It's very much the, um, yeah, I would say it's like the overriding, overarching message of the sutra. You know, and it has to do with, it has to do with this Mahayana idea of how, how one can see the Tathagata. How can one observe, see, understand, perceive the Buddha, the Tathagata? And in the Mahayana tradition, they will be very quick and very clear to say that the Buddha cannot be perceived by physical form, by the physical body. And even when we get to these, um, uh, it says here that then uh, Bhadra also beheld the Tathagata endowed with the 32 auspicious characteristics or signs or marks, Lakshana, with the 32 auspicious Lakshana and the 80 minor Lakshana. I did a, a night about this a few uh, weeks ago, so I won't go into it too much, but Buddha's, the Buddha is described as having these 32 auspicious physical characteristics, as well as these 80 minor physical characteristics, but let's just focus on the 32 major characteristics. So what we're gonna kind of get into tonight is perception, um, how to perceive things in that way, um, how to discern things, and so the question becomes, well, how do you, how do you discern the Buddha? Like, how do you recognize, or how do you know you're looking at the Buddha and not just some clown or some joker, right? How do you know it's the Buddha? And what they will say, of course, is that a Buddha has these 32 auspicious characteristics. 
And let me remind you that these lakshana, these characteristics, the idea is, is that we discern, we determine, we perceive what things are based upon their characteristics, right? And so if I were to grab my good old fashioned clock, you might know, you might be able to perceive and see that this is a clock and you would do that based on its characteristics, right? The, the hands, the, what would be called the face of the clock, you know, it, 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 it looks like a clock, right? It looks like one. That meaning it has the characteristics or the qualities, meaning it has the lakshana of a clock. And you might even then go so far as to say that this clock is the same color as my shirt, that they have the same characteristic or quality as it pertains to color, right? So color is a lakshana, size. Uh, in fact, there's a way in which when we're talking about Lakshana, we're talking about any kind of characteristic or quality, not just visual, auditory, meaning if I were to hold this up to my microphone and it was going, you'd be like, oh, that's the characteristic of a clock. It's making the sound of a clock. Looks like a clock, sounds like a clock, must be a clock, right? If it were a piece of fruit, you might take a bite or smell it, and based upon the smell or based upon the taste, you could discern what it is based on the characteristics. So how do you know when you're looking at a Buddha? How do you know when you're looking at the Tathagata? Well, what the idea is, is that a Buddha has these auspicious, subtle characteristics or qualities. And they're not like size, shape, color. They're not like those. These are kind of some truly subtle, auspicious characteristics. And in many ways, what these poems are uh, that I'm going to read tonight, we're going to get into this, these specific characteristics or qualities of the Buddha. Um, and so I just want you to kind of know that that's what we're going to be swimming in tonight. It's what we're going to be working with tonight. Or like this idea of how does one perceive the Buddha within the Mahayana tradition? So after the magician saw nothing except the Buddha everywhere, he was overwhelmed with joy and attained the Samadhi of the recollection of the Buddha. And this is actually within the framework of this sutra. This is actually the first turning point that leads to Bhadra's ultimate enlightenment. And there's going to be these three, I mentioned these three turning points or these three stages. And the first is this samadhi of the, of what would actually be called Buddha Nashmurti the recollection of the Buddha or Buddha Sati. Um, but in Sanskrit, Sati, mindfulness, is Shmurti. And you often hear this idea of Buddha Nashmurti, the recollection of the Buddha, recalling the Buddha to mind. And it's a particular meditation. It's a particular samadhi. And upon seeing nothing but the Buddha everywhere, Bhajra attains this samadhi of the mindfulness of the Buddha or the recollection of the Buddha. Coming out of that samadhi, he joined his palms together, bowed to the Buddha and spoke in verse saying, in the past, my conjurations were thought to be the most excelled in the world. But now I see they cannot compare with to even a tiny part of the miraculous powers of the Buddha. Now I know how inconceivable are the Buddha's miraculous powers. He can at will 
produce manifested Buddhas as innumerable as the sands in the Ganges River. All the Tathagatas that I see have the same 32 auspicious marks. May the world honored one, the Buddha, show me which one is the real Buddha. I wish to make offerings to one of these Tathagatas. May the world honored one tell me which will lead to reaping the supreme fruit. Ordinary people who do not revere the Buddha will forfeit their peace and happiness. Now, in the presence of the world honored one, I confess that I have committed the foolishness of testing the Tathagata. I hope that this misdeed will be forever annulled. May Brahma, Chakra, and the entire assembly all bear witness for me. In order to deliver all sentient beings, I now make the solemn vow to strive for unexcelled perfect enlightenment. I shall enlighten all beings with the light of wisdom. I shall give them the sweet nectar of the Dharma and fill the entire universe with it. Okay, I'm gonna pause there because there's a few things I wanna say. So what happens in that poem, of course, is, and you might've caught it, the magician Bhadra makes the initial determination for Anuttara Samyak Sambodhi. This is an idea that we've spoken about in Dharma Doors past. It's kind of this, um, one of the hallmarks, one of the real distinguishing features of Mahayana Buddhism, which is that a practitioner of Mahayana Buddhism does not make a vow to just alleviate their own suffering. They actually make this vow to kind of alleviate the suffering of all beings, or as I was saying earlier, to bring all beings to maturity, because we actually all relieve ourselves of suffering. Nobody relieves it for us in that way. So the Dharma, the sweet nectar of the Dharma, as Bhadra says, is that very um, uh, teaching that can help us alleviate our own suffering in that way. And so Bhadra has made this initial determination for enlightenment. That's very, very significant. But the one thing, of course, that's happening here is that the Buddha has manifested all of these uh, Buddhas, many, many Buddhas, not just all these uh, elders, but all of these images of the Buddha. And Bhadra, of course, is like, wow, like there's no way I, I can do that. Your, your magic, your conjurations are better than mine. I want to remind you really quickly from part one, and I mentioned it also in part two and three, one of the original versions of the magic competition uh, is called the miracle at Shravasti. And it's actually, there's a few things that happen in this miracle at Shravasti that's kind of a prototype in a way for this. But a, one important aspect of that is that the Buddha manifests uh, these uh, versions of himself. Some of them are laying down, some of them are walking, some of them are standing, and some of them are in full lotus. But he kind of produces this um, miraculous display, as it's called, of all of these different Buddhas. That's a Shravasti, that's kind of this prototypical tale. We're getting a, um, you know, we're getting a, a version of that miracle here when the Buddha produces all of these uh, different versions of himself. But then what's interesting about Bhadra's inquiry is he's saying, you know, I, I really want to make offerings to the real Buddha, to the true Buddha. So he kind of asks the Buddha, which one is the real you? And tell me, because then I'll, I'll make offerings to that real true version of you in that way, right? Then he goes on to say, how can a sensible person not aspire to awakening 
not aspire to Bodhi when he sees the Buddha perform such miraculous feats, when he hears such pleasant words and witnesses the wonderful deeds and unimpeded wisdom of the Buddha. May the world honored one show me the way to awakening, the way to Bodhi and all the pure deeds associated with it. Pray, show me the superior devotion, which is beyond the Shravakas and Pratekya Buddhas. In what should one abide when practicing the Dharma? How can one always win respect and offerings? How can one be dignified in demeanor? How should one remove doubts and regrets? How should one seek wide, seek wide learning tirelessly? and firmly establish oneself in it? How can one teach others the true Dharma and cause them to delight in it? How can one teach without expecting material rewards? How can one be grateful and return favors? How can one always be a permanent friend to all sentient beings? How can one avoid bad company? and associate with good friends? How can one meet Buddhas and make offerings to them without weariness? What are the right subjects of study and how can one esteem and sanctify them all? What are the essential elements to produce samadhi? How can one achieve a mind in harmony with the Dharma and cast away the mind that is in discord with the Dharma? How can one acquire right thought? How can one be free of fear, timidity, and weakness and become invulnerable to Mara? How should one contemplate the meaning of the Dharma? How can one never forsake sentient beings? What is to be preserved? What should be embraced without clinging to it? How can one practice right action and be endowed with ingenuity? How can one cultivate kindness and compassion, achieve miraculous powers, realize unimpeded eloquence, and ultimately acquire dharanis? How can one attain the realization of the truth of the Dharma and obtain pure eloquence? How should one abandon how should one abandon? What must be abandoned? How can one penetrate the profound dharma? How can one fulfill vows and aspirations and gain non-regression from the paramitas? I am willing to practice all the dharmas with diligence. May the world honored one of great compassion please explain these for me. Okay. Those are Bajra's questions, right? Those are all the pertinent questions of the Bodhisattva path in that way. He's kind of actually going through them, you know, kind of in a very specific order, I have to say, which actually goes all the way to the attaining of Dharanis, right? And attaining the stage of non-retrogression. These are all ideas that should at least sound familiar to you from Dharma Door's past. Um, if not make perfect sense in that way. Um, let me just take a moment to pause there. Any questions, comments, or ideas about what's happened so far or if we're lost? I just want to make sure we're not lost or anything. Everybody doing okay? Excellent, excellent. Okay. Um, so I really do think at this point, it's much better just to have the Buddha speak in that way. Um, because these, these questions that Vajra has are what the Buddha is about to answer with his poem. So rather than sort of <clears throat> uh, going through all of those points, point by point, and explaining what they mean, let's just do them with the answers. And then we'll go slowly through that way. Um, I also wanted to check. 
I don't think there was any major differences in the translations. Yeah, uh, there's a few things here and there, but I'd rather just keep it moving. So let's go over then to the world honored one answering in verse. So listen up, Bhadra. If one knows that all dharmas are like magic and illusions, they will be able to produce magically the bodies of 10 billion Buddhas and deliver beings in millions of lands, just as by magic, Bhadra can conjure up various things out of nothing. I'm going to pause there. <laughs> I'm going to pause there. So that's the theme of the sutra, of course, this idea that all dharmas are like illusions, like conjurations, like magic. All right. And I think, yeah, I think even before we continue to read, I want to really make clear all of those different words and all of those different ideas. So how does you know one attain all this stuff? What is the real dharma? How does one teach the real dharma? Well, the Buddha says that if one knows that all dharmas are like magic and illusions, they will be able to produce magically the bodies of 10 billion Buddhas and deliver beings in millions of lands. Just like the magician Bhajra can conjure up various things out of nothing. So this is... You know, this is a, of course, a, a major point in the Mahayana Buddhist tradition, but as we're going to see very, very soon, it is certainly not limited to the Mahayana tradition. But what I'm referring to, though, is the kind of famous concluding Gatha stanza poem, the concluding poem in the Vajra Pranyaparamita Sutra, otherwise known as the Diamond Sutra, in which the Buddha says famously that all dharmas, all phenomena, all things should be viewed like shadows, like illusions, like bubbles. Um, and he, in that sutra, in that poem, the Buddha employs a few different similes to view all phenomena as like uh, dreams, even actually dreams, shadows, illusions, bubbles like lightning and like dew. This sutra sort of just is taking that one idea of all dharmas being like illusions and kind of running with that, okay? And I wanna, let's see, and try somewhere here. Okay, so when we say in Buddhism, when we say all dharmas are like illusions, when we say a dharma, you know, that word's tricky, of course, in Buddhism. It means truth, it means principle, it's a word for the teachings of the Buddha. But at its most basic sense, and it's very much the sense that is being used here, a dharma is anything you could possibly think of, conceive of, have a name for, have a word for, anything. No matter how big, no matter how small, how ephemeral, how whatever, if it is, if it basically, if it has a word, a label, it's a dharma. If you've got a word for it, that's a dharma, right? And so, Again, whether we're talking about clocks, whatever it is, the teaching here is to say that all dharmas, all phenomena is like an illusion. And, you know, I often like to employ these little optical illusions. And I wanted, I like to employ these optical illusions for a reason, because the idea here is, is that you might perceive that I have a glass, a cup in my hand. Or you might see 
two people facing face to face. If it's a glass, that's one dharma. That would be one idea, one concept, one thing that you have a word for, a name for. And insofar as you think I have a glass in my hand, right? Then that's the dharma. That's the thing. But if you don't see this as solid, but you see these as solid, then you see two people. And that would be, I guess, two dharmas in that way. Now, the teaching here begins, of course, by contemplating there being two people here. And not, not these two people, but two perceivers. And one person sees the glass. And the other person sees two people. The question, of course, is who's right? Somebody's got to be right, right? Show me which one's the real Buddha, right? That's Bhadra's question, right? Which one's the real Dharma? Like, what do I, what do I really have? And then what is illusory? What's not happening? And of course, in this little optical illusion, it's very clear. They are both illusory. It is neither a cup nor faces at an ultimate sense. What it is, is a, a shape that can be understood as a glass, faces, it could be called that, but it's a shape. It's a form in that sense. and. That right there is actually the teaching of all dharmas being like illusions, which is to say there's not a glass or faces out here. There's a glass or faces in your head, in your mind. And when I do this and the idea of, ooh, Michael's has two face uh, pictures of two people then that is the dependently originated phenomena, but to construe it as being two people out in space would be, would be wrong. That would be to miss the optical illusion, right? Of course, the person who thinks it's a glass is also under the spell in that sense. Also mistaking form, mistaking a shape for something. And so the glass is also in the mind of the beholder in that sense, not out in the world. So, of course, what's interesting about this is, is that it's the same form producing both of those illusions. And so that gets tricky regarding form. In fact, I want to take this opportunity to go one step beyond form to just take a peek into what the Buddhists call the formless realm. It's gonna be really helpful, I think, tonight to have this foundation. So let's say you have, let's say you are a, a sommelier, right? A wine steward, and all day you deal with wine glasses, right? And so you might be conditioned in a certain way, being a sommelier, to see and associate things with wine and wine bottles and wine glasses. And so when I do that, you see a wine glass because it's like, that's it. But now let's say actually that there's this other person who has like a social anxiety disorder and they're just like constantly kind of on the lookout for people and to avoid them. So when I do this, it's like, whoa, people. So insofar as somebody gets a little nervous or anxious, let's say, because of this, then that is their, what we will call, what the Buddhists call, their kama datu, their realm of desire. But desire here, of course, we're talking about social anxiety, so that's not desirable. So the, to call it the realm of desire is a little misleading.
But the idea is, is that there's a realm of, it's called the Kama Datu, not the Karma Datu, but the Kama, K-A-M-M-A, Kama Datu. And it's about the emotions that this stuff causes in us. Maybe it's fear, or if you'll, you're the sommelier, maybe it's joy and excitement and familiarity. But the idea is, is that I show these two people that, and they are both in their own little universes. One is anxious, one is excited, or at least, you know, comfortable because they know what they're looking at in that way, right? So the realm of desire is truly, truly, truly unique for each of us in that way, because we are all conditioned differently. We have all suffered differently. We all have our different pasts that then have conditioned us to respond to phenomena, to dharmas in different ways. So the first level of wisdom is recognizing not everybody has the same reaction to things that I do, because my reactions are based on my history and somebody else might have an entirely different history. So that's the first bit of wisdom that tries to you know, clear the mirror of the gunk of the Kamadatu. Michael? Uh, yes. Hey, um, quick question. I think I'm going into a wrong direction with my thinking. So maybe you can pull me back. So um, based on what you explained and dependent origination about uh, reality illusion, you clearly um, uh, stated that, that uh, there is no objective reality out there and everything depends on your, basically on your conditioning, on your karma, right? But so, but kind of it, it seems like, and I think I'm wrong, but it seems like you are uh, implying that um, reality is created, which I think, yeah, is created in your own mind. And then, you know, then the, which is, I know it's wrong. So help me like, because it seems like, oh, consciousness is uh, behind my ears, uh, eyes and between my ears, which y y no. So can you elaborate a little bit more? Yes, absolutely. Um, absolutely. Hold on just one second. It's basically where this goes but now I will make sure we get there. So, and, and by the way, Connie, I am, I'm starting us kind of way back in delusion, way back in, in, in the depths of unenlightenment and, and working our way right, right to your question. So the first layer, the first layer of wisdom is recognizing not everybody has the same emotional reactions to things. Everybody's not going to find the same things beautiful that I find beautiful. Everybody's not going to find the same things ugly that I find ugly, useful, not useful. All of that, that kind of evaluation is very much going to be in uh, the mind of the perceiver in huge scare quotes in the mind of the perceiver. If we kind of can come to a wise understanding of that, which isn't really actually that hard to do. It, it actually just takes the slightest bit of, of uh, compassion in that way of stepping out of, of one's own purview. Then we are left with, okay, faces or glass, maybe it's not causing any emotional turmoil. Maybe I'm beyond the realm, like maybe I've meditated and I've gotten into a kind of a dionic state where I'm no longer kind of emotionally reacting to this stuff. If that is the case, then that is what it would be called abiding in the realm of form. Not the realm of desire, not the kamadatu that's all, you know, got all this emotional baggage and trauma and all that stuff. Just, just the realm of discernment just the realm of distinguishing this from that, just the realm of shape and form. That's why they call it the realm of form, the, 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 the rupa datu, because it's just about the shape. It's not about these causing me anxiety, but the idea here is, is that even the realm of 
form is a little tricky. And that's kind of, that's where we're at right now is, yeah, yeah, the realm of desires over there, but even distinguishing these from this, seeing it as this or seeing it as that is a subtler form of discrimination, let's call it, or even discernment or perception. It's a subtler form of it, and it's taking place in the realm of form. But the idea here is, is does your mind attach to the block in the middle, or does your mind attach to the blocks on the side? Like, where does your attention lie and consider there to be something? And what is just vacuousness? So even the realm of form is very, very tricky. And as I pointed out with my example, the realm of form is not the same for these two people because one person is seeing the shape of a forehead, the shape of a nose, the shape of lips. But the other person is seeing the shape of the, the mouth of the glass, the stem, the base of the glass. So what we realize is that, is that even the realm of form is subjective, dependent upon one's purview in that way. Michael, can, is, is what comes into play, is it uh, uh, quantum physics that ba basically, no, that, no, 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 nope. okay, okay. I'm, I'm so close to answering the question about the mind, this idea of the mind. So, you know, many of you have heard this before, seen this before, been through this before. I, I ask you not to give up on me, though. There's always a uh, reason to go through this. So now, if you're familiar with Buddhist meditation, you know that it's about we abide most of the time kind of in this realm of desire, wants, fear, anxiety, all of that. If we can calm our minds down in that way or calm our hearts down, then we could just sort of see their form and not be triggered by it and all of that. But then within this example, how would you, how does one distinguish, discern, or discriminate? How does one discern, distinguish, or discriminate what they're looking at at all? And the idea is, is that actually even deeper and more beyond the realm of form is what is called the formless realm. The formless realm is traditionally this place of very deep meditation. And there are sort of different um, ways to meditate on the realm of formlessness, the a-rupa-dhatu, a-rupa, no rupa, no form. There's a few different ways to meditate on the formless realm. And the first way, kind of the premier way, is to meditate on or to consider what is called akasha, space. Space is this beautiful idea. It's not unique to Buddhism, but Buddhism definitely took this ball and ran with it as far as uh, kind of the philosophy and meditation goes. So. If I were to hold up this and ask you, what is it? If you were to say two faces, you could only make that determination because there's space between them. And if this space actually disappeared and these collapsed into one, then that would be one. It wouldn't be two faces anymore. In other words, this space is a very, very important aspect to this form. But it works the other way too, which is that if you discern, perceive, or understand that I have a, a glass in my hand, 
you could only conceive of it as a glass because of the space here and here and here and here. So there's this realm of space, the Akasha Datu, this realm of space that's kind of everywhere and nowhere. And the idea here is, is that any time one discriminates or discerns something, that is only possible because there is space. And what I mean is, is that if there wasn't any space, kind of everything would collapse into one object. An example that I often give is this one. So depending upon, you know, depending on what I'm asking, if I say, what is that? You know, depending on what you think I'm talking about, your mind, in order to zero in on it, like, oh, I don't know, let's say I, I said my hand, even though my hand is part of Michael, for you to discern, distinguish, or discriminate the hand, it requires this. In fact, what's even weirder about it is it requires, and there's, there's no space here. There's space here, like good old fashioned vacuous space. But what I wanna get at is that space is not, it's not this. Space is an aspect of thinking. It's an aspect of discernment, discrimination. And the idea here is, is that if I say it, well, my hand, then you, you create a weird artificial boundary and, and create space between my arm and my hand in order for the hand to be understandable. But then if I said, no, not my hand, my fingers, you need the space in order to distinguish each of the fingers because if there was no space between them, and again, I don't mean this space, I mean the cognitive space where there's this dance going on between form and space, that in order for there to be a form, you gotta have space around it. Because again, if there's no space, it's gonna collapse all together. But definitely keep in mind this idea that space is an element of cognition, for, for lack of a better term consciousness for lack of a better term, vinyana. Space is an aspect of vinyana, an aspect of, of thinking or consciousness in that way. So now we get to Connie's question, which is, the, which is the question to be asking, which is, oh, so you're saying all of this is in my head or my mind, but the real, this is, this is, a, this is an optical illusion. When we get down to real, uh, not optical illusions, but what we consider to be reality, everything I just said is still at play. But there's one wild, wild aspect of space that gives rise to a particular conception of form. And what that space is, is this space, the space between me and you. So it is out of this space that I perceive between us that I arise as a form, as an idea, as a concept. So in other words, Connie, even perceiving of yourself being between the ears and behind the eyes is a product of this realm of form arising out of a realm of infinite space. So would you say thought arises within the space as well? There is a very, um, um, it's a very difficult question to answer only because of the nature of reality, but it's a very difficult question to answer 
But let me put it to you this way. So if you're familiar with traditional Buddhist meditation that moves, it moves the meditator out of the realm of desire, out of the realm of anxiety and fear and stress and all of that into this nice, peaceful realm of pure form where these objects and these forms are not getting me worked up. I can just discern shape, size, color, number, stuff like that. But then the meditator, if you know, goes even deeper into the realm of what is called infinite space. And what's really wild about this, what I've been trying to walk you through is, you know, when, when I say, what is that? And it's like, wow, it depends, Michael, like, what are you talking about? So in other words, like your, the cognitive mind is like, all right, I'm ready, Michael. I will tell you what it is, like as soon as I know what the space is, as soon as I know what not to count, I can tell you what to count in that way. So what the idea here is, is that if you, if you really kind of hold on to what I keep saying, which is that space is not here. Space is gonna be in the perceiver and it's gonna be a, dim, um, this is where it gets always gets really tricky, but there's a way in which perception needs space. Again, if there weren't space, it would all collapse in, <laughs> into to one. And so the mind is sort of the creator of space, sort of, kind of, in a way. Because again, it's not anything, it's nowhere, it cannot be measured. It cannot, it has no qualities. It's not a thing in any way. It actually is what allows for, for thinging. And the reason why I said it that way, very odd like that, is that when I, it's like, what thing? No, no, no. The space that you will use to discern allows for thinging. It allows for you to thing something either the two people or the glass. But it, for, in order for you to thing that out, thing it, you would need to then rely upon the space, which is always there. If you can kind of put your mind in the right way and understand that there's a lot of space here. In fact, you could kind of start to see the space kind of everywhere and you could eventually slip into what is called a samadhi, and it would be the samadhi of infinite space. And what I mean by that is, is that if you remember, like, you know, if I don't tell you yet, if I don't tell you what I'm talking about yet, and if you remember, this is space if it's faces, but this is space if it's a glass. In other words, what I just said is this is space and this is space. And depending on where you want to go with it, you can form this and make and keep this the space. Or you can form this out and make this the space. What happens when you don't do either though? What happens when you hold off on thinging? What happens when you hold off on that? discernment and just stay in the space. I like to call akasha space. I like to refer to it as allowance. I like to refer to it as this kind of idea of allowance. A, to avoid thinking of it as a thing and to think of it more as a possibility, allowance. Space is what allows for things to exist. And just like this, it's kind of like infinite space until the mind settles on something. In other words, you could kind of see that process as the mind sort of dipping into infinite space infinite allowance, infinite possibility, 
and then reaching in and pulling out a glass from the infinite space, from the infinite allowance. But what happens if it's the moment right before you reach in and it's just infinite possibility, infinite allowance? That's akin to, if not the same thing as, the realm of infinite space where you are viewing things, but not the form, the space. And it's not, and, re, and I want to remind you of this, this is not like, like about blurring your eyes or something, or like, it's not about that. It's actually about a form of cognition that doesn't um, grasp and cling at things. It's good old fashioned Buddhism, right? But the idea here is, is that, you know, I, I use this one, and I use this one a lot, but what I mean is, is that my example here, it's very easy to reach into that realm of infinite space and pull out a clock, right? But the thing about this is that we call this one thing, all evidence to the contrary, right? It's, it's a bunch of stuff but my mind can hold it as a singularity, as, a, as one thing. And so uh, it, that, that in itself is a little weird, this process of um, what I call singularizing, you know, taking what is obviously multiple and just wrapping it together with one word and thinking, it's one thing. How many things do I have in my hand? Right? Well, the idea here is, is that if you're following me on that and you're like, oh, wow, that's wild. A clock is just a word. And actually, this is a bunch of stuff. It's not just one thing. In other words, you have reached into the realm of allowance of infinite space. And because you're holding on to the idea of the clock, Behold, a clock. I'll tell you one other interesting thing that is a multiple, but that can be singularized with one label. This is a multiple. This has got all kinds of stuff going on. But you can do it, and I can do it too, which is all of this can be singularized into Michael, one name. And if you understood what I was saying about the clock, vis-a-vis -vis space, the same thing is happening regarding this idea of our self, by which I mean this idea of the singular you. You know, you. <laughs> that one thing. So that has been a very long, um, I, and all of that was very intentional in terms of ideas that really need to be fresh on our, on our minds. Michael, I have one last question, sorry. Um, I hope I'm not annoying any, anyone with all of my questions. <laughs> um, Noam, you can kick me out. So um, what do you elaborated is, um, so, you know, I want to go back to reality and, and um, you know, the th that what we, what we experience is um, not fundamental, it's changing. Um, it's same with, I put in very simple words, same with the eye, right, what we discussed many, many, many times. And I feel like, okay, what is there anything that is substantial? Is there anything underlying fundamental? Um, not of, of substance, but from, uh, but of quality or something, right? The only thing that I can come down in my uh, immediate experience is when I do these exercises that you just suggested is perceiving. This is, hmm. I, you know, the eye is changing, uh, reality that it is changing in infinite space, pointedness space, blah, 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 but perceiving 
even when there is not an I in a very single fragment of a moment, is there. There's something as experiencing or perceiving. So is there anything you can, you know, you can add to that? I can, um, for, for simplicity's sake, I'm going to, to say kind of, yeah, <laughs> kind of, yeah, Connie. I, it's tricky. I don't want to get too into it. Uh, the, my caveat, my, my one caveat would be the, the particular word perceive. It's a tricky term in Buddhism. Samya would be perception, and Samya is not exactly, Samya is perceiving a glass or a face. And what you're, I think what you're talking about, Connie, is not the perception of faces or the glass, but the one that understands what the heck I just am talking about. <laughs> that steps back and sees the realm of infinite space in a way. Yeah, honey, boom, boom. Yeah, so not perception, but you are, the way you're thinking is right in that way. So Inlet, any other questions, comments, ideas? Yeah, Jenny. And that's, that's really, in my mind, what it's about. It's, it's that infinite possibility moment that happens before the singing, before the fear, before the hate, before the judgment, to be able to back it up and see the infinite possibilities and just live in that as the thing. I don't know if that made any sense, but. Crystal clear to me. And, and by the way, Jenny, what you said reminded me to remind everyone that when we're at that level of viewing all dharmas, all phenomena, and we're at that deep way, you know, before the anger, before the hate, even before the discrimination and separation of this versus that, when we're at this even deeper level, there's a way in which if you're really there, it should br bring upeksha, it should bring equanimity, because at that stage, nothing could be more bigger or more whatever than anything else, if you truly understand it at that level. And that's the beauty of this teaching, is it's kind of an express route to equanimity or upeksha. And it's why the Mahayana tradition is so focused on this idea of emptiness or dependent origination, because it equalizes everything very, very quickly in that way. So any other questions, comments, ideas? All right, so I think now we will be able to really hear what the Buddha has to say. So I'm going to start over just to, I only read that one stanza. So if one knows that all dharmas, all phenomena, all objects, all things, if one knows that all dharmas are like magic and like illusions, like optical illusions in that way, they will be able to produce magically the bodies of 10 billion Buddhas and deliver beings in millions of lands just as by magic, Bajra can conjure up various things out of nothing. The Buddha continues, phenomena, things do not arise nor cease, nor do they abide, they do not come, they do not go. The same is true of the monks, and all the miraculously transformation, uh, all the miraculous transformation bodies of the Buddha. They neither come into being, nor do they perish, nor do they attain nirvana. All these are the Tathagata's inconceivable miracles. Troops mounted on elephants or horses, conjured up by a magician, 
are mistaken for real. They are mistaken by, for real by confused sentient beings. In truth, these mounted troops have no entity and do not ever arise. Similarly, Buddhas have no real appearance. They neither come nor go. Okay, I am gonna pause there because I wanna share something with you. Yeah, and I think we're gonna have to just pick this back up next week because there's a lot of interesting information in here. But on that note of troops mounted on elephants or horses conjured up by a magician are mistaken for real by confused sentient beings. In truth, these mounted troops have no entity and do not arise. So that, that might sound familiar to you. And if it does, it's because I once a long time ago back uh, at, at the SFDC, I taught a course, or I taught, I, I did a Dharma talk one night, I should say, and the sutra that I did was called the Fena Sutra, P-H-E-N-A, which is called a lump of foam. That's a Fena, a lump of foam. And I did this sutra because it's full of these beautiful similes, uh, similes like the lotus flower rising out of water, uh, similes like a lump of foam. There is and oh, and by the way, if you don't know, the Fena Sutta is a very old Pali Sutta, so from the old Pali-based tradition. It's in the Samyutta Nikaya, the uh, connected discourses of the Buddha. It is Sutra number 90, let's see, it's actually Sutra number 22.95, and I've said this before, but the sutras in this, they seem to be some of the oldest, cr chronologically speaking. So this is a very old sutta. And in this very old sutta, the Buddha says, suppose, bhikshus, that a magician or a magician's apprentice would display a magical illusion at a crossroads. A man with good sight would inspect it, ponder it, and carefully investigate it, and it would appear to them to be void, hollow, and insubstantial. For what substance could there be in a magical illusion? So too, bhikshus, whatever kind of consciousness there is, whether past consciousness, future consciousness, or present consciousness, internal consciousness or external consciousness, gross consciousness or subtle consciousness, inferior consciousness or superior, far or near. A bhikshu inspects it, ponders it, and carefully investigates it. And it would appear to them to be void, hollow, and insubstantial. For what substance could there be in consciousness? So that, um, when you get into reading Mahayana Buddhist sutras, like, like this one we're reading tonight, it, it'll mention this magician at a crossroads. And that is the origin of that story, this idea. And it seems to be probably the first time, if not the first time, it's the major time that the Buddha made this comparison. Now, in the Fena Sutra that I just read, the Buddha makes the comparison that consciousness is like magical illusions. But if you, you know, if you know your Dharma, and I, I mean that literally here, meaning that if you know that consciousness in Buddhism, vinyana, consciousness sort of, uh, how can I put this? It, it, uh, consciousness is in the business of dealing with dharmas, ideas. Consciousness is not actually in the business of dealing with objects. 
It's in the business of dealing with ideas about objects. Ideas in Buddhism are called dharmas. So you can almost sort of trace the genesis of Mahayana Buddhism. You can definitely trace the genesis of this idea that all dharmas are illusory from that kind of Fena Sutra, Sutta all the way up to our Bhadra Sutra. And so I think the main teaching, you know, I don't want to get too, yeah, I can't get too into the next section. So I kind of want to just sort of conclude this evening with this kind of one simple statement about what the message of the sutra is. It, they've said it several times. To view all dharmas as like illusions. In other words, I showed you this one and I do these optical illusions. You know, I have my duck rabbit one and I got all these other ones. And I do these to, you know, put our minds in the right way where you can start to imagine or you can start to think about how somebody else conditioned differently would view this differently. And then what, I, what we need to do though is then go that next level to all of these objects in our world that we might hoard, we might cry over, we might whatever, all these different dharmas, all these different ideas. And this teaching, which is saying that the, the, the wise move here is to view all dharmas as like illusions in that way. I also, I will share with you one last thing. Let's see. Well, I don't think I'll be able to find it, but there's another beautiful um, uh, Mahayana Sutra. It's called the Samdhinir Mochana Sutra, um, if you're familiar with it. But it's another Mahayana Sutra that uses the magician at the crossroads analogy. Um, yeah, and it's kind of a long section, so I won't even bother trying to find it. But the gist of that version of the story is it says that there's this magician at the crossroads who uses all kinds of scrap material to make these uh, horse, what, the troops mounted on horses and all these animals. What the sutra, what that sutra says is that there are people in the audience that think the animals are real and they are afraid of them. The sutra says though, but there are bodhisattvas in the audience and they see the same magic show as everybody else. They see the same animals that the other people see but the bodhisattvas are not afraid of them. The reason why I think that that version of the story is so important is because it talks about like what's at stake or what the difference is in, in the bodhisattva path versus just the kind of normal average everyday path in that way. And in particular, just what I want to reinforce is this idea that the bodhisattvas in the audience, according to the Samdhinir Mochana, they see exactly what the other people see. They just know that it's a magic show, an illusion, and so they know they have no reason to be afraid. That's a very important point when it comes to this kind of teaching of emptiness in that way. This understanding that things are like magical illusions and therefore lack svabhava, lack self-nature and are therefore empty. When one understands this emptiness, it's not like all this stuff disappears. When you understand the emptiness or no self, it's not like you disappear. It's just that, as, as I often like to say, one's disposition towards the world changes in that way. And I think, again, that's really important if you are curious and it's like, if you're new to this or, or whatever, and you're thinking like, oh, emptiness, like that sounds scary or that sounds bleak or that sounds nihilistic. All we're talking about is the wisdom that is not afraid of the things of, these, of this world. 
versus the delusion that does get anxious and afraid in that way. And so that's sort of the real, um, at least the, a good teaching I can leave you with tonight. So. All right, everybody. That's it for me. Thank you so much. I'm looking forward to continuing the Vajra Sutra uh, next week, making no promises of how long this will take. So we'll just have to stay tuned.